Excellency, thank you very much for joining us on Bloomberg Television. You're heading to the UNGA in a few days at a time when, believe it or not, there is renewed tension in the Middle East. The peace process is in tatters. There is tension between U.S. and Iran is rising. ISIS is making, is making a comeback in Libya. What among these issues, or maybe other issues, that keeps you up at night? Where do you see the biggest risk to Egypt's stability and the region? And do you see actually any room for improvement here and there? Well, you've just mentioned uh, quite a number of hotspots all related to this region and all have a direct impact on the security and the stability and the prosperity of Egypt and uh, other states in, in the region. Uh, this is a, uh, a shrinking world, and especially in our region, the uh, inter interdependency of uh, uh, the states of the Middle East and uh, the effects of uh, the current tensions that have been with us for quite a number of years now uh, has uh, continued to uh, place uh, enormous uh, challenges uh, in maintaining our security and in, in dealing with the issues of terrorism, uh, illegal migration, in securing our borders, uh, but also, of course, uh, the Palestinian uh, issue is, is uh, foremost uh, in terms of our priority because of its direct impact on the Palestinian people in the occupied territories, uh, their inalienable rights to uh, the creation of their own uh, state, and uh, the current uh, status of, uh, of a process of, to achieve peace that uh, is uh, somewhat uh, uh, stagnant. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, continue to work uh, diligently to address all of these challenges uh, and to, uh, for both uh, our own uh, security and, and success, but also uh, we uh, know very well that uh, we need an environment uh, that is an enabling, that uh, will provide the security for all states and all peoples of the region in an equal uh, and uh, mutually beneficial manner. Actually, the Palestinian issue uh, and the peace process has been grabbing uh, its fair share of headlines recently. We see President Trump rewriting the rules that, has, that have underpinned negotiations over the past uh, 25 years since the Oslo Agreement. His decision on Jerusalem to move the, cap, to move the, cap, to move the, the embassy to Jerusalem and lately on UNRWA. And one of the perceptions is that he's able to push with this because there is a lack of a robust Arab response and everybody keeps, to, keeps warning of violence. Oh, it's gonna, they're going to be violence, but nothing's, nothing's happening. Do you see a serious risk of violence and how do you, where do you see, see this going, going forward? I think there's an obligation on everyone to uh, avoid violence, to uh, work uh, to uh, achieve stability and to uh, consolidate uh, the peace. Uh, but definitely there are many pressures that uh, are created by uh, unilateral decisions uh, and I think the uh, Arab world, uh, whether in the uh, last Arab summit or in the subsequent uh, ministerial meetings of the Arab League, there's been a very consistent position uh, related to all of these issues. Uh, the, I think the parameters for a negotiated settlement are well known. The Arab Peace Initiative is still uh, on the table and is uh, still uh, embraced by all of the Arab states and constitutes a, a very uh, practical uh, uh, mechanism to uh, move forward the, the process and end the conflict and uh, it is only uh, through uh, continuing dial dialogue and uh, engagement that we can uh, hopefully reach a uh, settlement that will end the conflict that will uh, fulfill the aspirations of the Palestinian people. You talked about an enabling environment for peace. Do you think this US administration is actually providing this environment? We hear about the famous deal of the century, the Jared Kushner deal, has any of the details been shared with you? And given that they are consistently changing that, you know, like for example the decision to end the funding for, for UNRWA, uh, where is, I mean, are we going to see some Arab states stepping in to fill that gap? Well, related to UNRWA, UNRWA is, uh, has been providing uh, the Palestinian people uh, services uh, that are uh, indispensable and it has uh, uh, been doing so now for uh, since the conflict uh, initiated in, uh, after 48 and uh, we believe that its current mandate uh, fulfills its objective. Uh, it, it is uh, important to, to be able to uh, uh, deal with the needs of the Palestinian people. Uh, this is a matter of, uh, of a humanitarian concern uh, but it's also a matter of uh, maintaining the, uh, the issue of refugees which is a major component of any uh, political settlement uh, at the forefront of uh, the uh, core issues. Uh, 
we hope that there will be, and we have had discussions the, uh, uh, with UNRWA during this last ministerial meeting of the Arab League. Uh, there, there are commitments by Arab states to uh, provide the necessary funds and also to uh, coordinate with other members of the international community who recognize the value and the importance of the uh, services that are rendered by UNRWA, and we will continue to do so. You say commitment by some Arab states to provide the funds. Is that in response to the U.S. cut, so to fill the gap? That has been since the Rome uh, conference, and uh, commitments were made by Arab and non-Arab states to uh, fill the gaps uh, uh, that have been created by uh, the withdrawal of, of American support to UNRWA uh, out of the recognition of the important role that UNRWA plays and the uh, humanitarian needs of the Palestinian people. And these commitments actually, you have confidence that given, in light of the recent events, will actually be mobilized and achieved? Well, I have every hope that they are, and uh, I think that there is a recognition, general recognition within the international community of the value of the services that UNRWA uh, provides, and that uh, there has to be a uh, continuance of these uh, services uh, so to meet the needs of the Palestinian people. What's at stake here? What's at stake to maintain UNRWA, to maintain, you know, at least some semblance of negotiations? Uh, you know, what's at stake if this doesn't happen? I mean, again, people talk about you know, there could be a, 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 if there's a collapse in UNRWA or if there's a collapse in the PA, that things could go out spiraling, but this is a risk that hasn't materialized. Well, if we are uh, to deal specifically with UNRWA, UNRWA is a, a UN mandate and uh, it continues to be the responsibility of the international community in accordance with the resolutions uh, and that mandate uh, to provide those services. Uh, and it's uh, a, an obligation, I don't want to say legal obligation because uh, the funding is voluntary, but it I think is more of a moral obligation uh, to deal with a, a very pertinent uh, issue and problem that has existed uh, and that is uh, recognized by the vast majority of the international community. Okay. I want to stay on the Palestine issue and go to Gaza where there have been mediations and, and, and efforts to stop that conflict from reigniting again. Can you give us a, prog a, a, like a status report on where is that? We also heard there is a direct track between Hamas and Israel to, for a long-term truce. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, so would like to hear from you. Well, Egypt is involved primarily in uh, the discussions on reconciliation between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, uh, the reintroduction of the Palestinian Authority to undertake its responsibilities in terms of governance of both the West Bank and Gaza, and uh, the need uh, for the Palestinian Authority to undertake those responsibilities uh, in relations to uh, agreements and uh, arrangements that were made in 2005 related to uh, European Union's uh, involvement with the crossings and uh, with the provision of uh, assistance uh, both in uh, the West Bank and in, in Gaza. Certainly the uh, conditions in, in Gaza, the economic conditions are uh, uh, quite uh, difficult and uh, there is a need to uh, take that into account and the best interests of the uh, vast majority of the Palestinian people who are uh, apolitical, who are uh, uh, who need the, the support of uh, the international community, but need also uh, the uh, uh, de-escalation de of uh, the tensions and the uh, ensuing military activity that has had a very uh, adverse impact on their uh, livelihoods and on, on their futures. Uh, Egypt is uh, uh, continuing to engage both uh, Hamas and the Palestinian Authority uh, to implement the various uh, segments of uh, of uh, an agreement that was forged between them, uh, but uh, there are many details and there are many issues that have to be resolved, and we will continue to play that role so as to uh, uh, achieve the stability in Gaza, uh, avoid uh, any military escalation, and at the same time uh, provide for the Palestinians uh, governance that can fulfill their needs. So your main responsibility is on the reconciliation rather than the, the security arrangement at, at the moment? That, that is our, uh, the focus of our uh, efforts. Okay, and is there any significant progress done since they last met here in terms of resolving the issues? Mm -hmm. and primarily it's also the Hamas uh, weaponry situation where, you know, the, the uh, Arms. Well, there are many components related to the agreement that was initially forged, and uh, uh, the detail, of course, is uh, uh, how to implement all of the various uh, elements and, of course, the varying interpretations uh, between the two sides. 
But uh, what is important to us is that uh, there remains a political commitment to undertake the reconciliation for the best interests of the Palestinian people, and uh, that is what we are striving to. We are striving to uh, help the Palestinian people in, in uh, de-escalating violence, in providing the governance that is uh, much needed, and in opening doors for uh, the access to the territories of uh, necessary goods and services uh, so that uh, it can uh, uh, fulfill the economic needs of, of the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, but also to uh, provide the humanitarian assistance that is uh, much needed as well. I want to talk about Egypt and the U.S. Egypt has been a key U.S. ally for, for decades. Like other allies, they saw the relationship with the U.S. under Obama go a, a bit, you know, say cold, but, you know, there was, there was some strain. And under Trump, we've seen relations improve between Egypt and the U.S., Saudi and the U.S., uh, you know, other, and, and some other countries. How do you rate this administration so far in its Middle East policy? Because they have good individual bilateral relations, uh, relationships, but he's rattling the cage. He quit the Iran deal. He's threatening to, you know, bomb Syria if, if there is a, a chemical attack in Idlib. He's basically, and he's, as, as we said, rewriting the rules of Middle East peace process against the advice of many. How do you see, how do you see the dichotomy in between? Well, I can only speak about the uh, Egyptian-U.S. relationship primarily, and uh, that is a relationship that has endured now for four decades. Uh, we have dealt with uh, a variety of uh, administrations, both uh, Republican and Democrat. Uh, but definitely, I think it has always been important to highlight the strategic nature of the relationship and the uh, uh, mutual recognition of the value that this relationship has uh, and the uh, uh, return uh, that uh, this relationship uh, provides to both uh, parties. And it has uh, consolidated the peace in the region. It has provided a degree of, of security and stability and continues to serve uh, uh, for those, those interests. Uh, generally, the region is uh, uh, the, t the level of turmoil in the region, whether it's in Syria, in, in Iraq, in Yemen, in, in uh, Libya, the threat of terrorism, all are uh, complicating factors, uh, and uh, whatever uh, policy decisions that the U.S. Uh, takes, uh, there is a great deal of, of uh, dialogue uh, between us uh, in, in uh, evaluation of, of what can best serve uh, for uh, peace and stability in the region, uh, and we will continue to uh, give our advice and, uh, and coordinate with the United States being a very active and, and important uh, player, not only regionally, but internationally. I want to ask a question on Syria. There is the, what many consider the final battle of the war uh, in Idlib. There are warnings of human disasters. There is the potential of a U.S. strike if the Assad regime uses chemical weapons. Turkey has said it's not going to stand by. How do you see this evolving? Do you see in, uh, un inevitable, uh, do you see in inevitable uh, 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 massacre there, or what's the risk of a multi-nation conflict at this stage? Well, I think we have to focus our attention to the suffering of the Syrian people over these last seven years. We have lost uh, more than 600,000 Syrian lives, and half of the population are uh, displaced in refugee camps in and outside of, of Syria. And uh, I think after this uh, very uh, dire experience, it's time for the international community to really focus on what is in the best interest of uh, the Syrian people, but also recognize that there are conditions and that there are organizations who uh, uh, continue to try through uh, the use of, of terror, through the use of uh, military uh, ability to uh, perpetuate this uh, conflict and to continue uh, to uh, inflict this suffering on the Syrian people. The situation in Idlib, of course, is a dangerous one, but uh, it is a uh, problem that has to be resolved through uh, greater coordination and understanding between all those involved in uh, the conflict in Syria, uh, whether the government, uh, the Russians, the Iranians, uh, the United States, uh, and all other interested parties. Uh, the, the greater the understanding and the coordination and the dialogue that exists, uh, and also recognizing where the problems lie. There is a problem in that uh, it has been allowed uh, for various uh, combatants and foreign fighters to uh, congregate on, on Idlib, and they represent a danger to those uh, same civilians inside of Idlib uh, that have to be protected from their uh, radicalization and from their uh, 
enforce uh, a way of life or uh, perpetuate the, the conflict in, in Syria. That also has to be addressed uh, through uh, a coordinated effort by the international community. I have one last question, and it's on arguably one of the biggest risks looming over the Middle East, which is the confrontation between the U.S. and Iran. The U.S. has other companies, countries on its camp, like Saudi Arabia, like Israel, who meet, with, they have in, in, common interest in that. Do you think pulling out of the deal actually contributes to more instability, or would you think that there is actually a good argument for betting, on betting that more sanctions would lead to a change in the Iranian behavior in the region, as the U.S. keeps arguing now? Well, we deal with the current situation and the current conditions, and uh, again, emphasize the need for uh, stability and security in the region, but uh, recognize that uh, there have been interventions by Iran in uh, the region, uh, in uh, the uh, national security interests of the Arab states, and uh, that this volatility uh, must uh, be uh, resolved. Uh, we uh, believe that uh, there, is, there should be no expansion of uh, influence within the uh, Arab domain. Uh, the Arab national security is an integral whole and must remain so. And uh, we look to negotiate the settlements to all of the disputes. We look also very seriously on the potential of, uh, of a nuclear development of a nuclear weapons capability and uh, the need for Iran to continue to respect and to adhere to all of its uh, legal obligations under the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, so as to avoid any potential of the use or uh, the threat of use of uh, nuclear weapons or the uh, potential of a nuclear arms race in the region with, which would uh, uh, compound the risks uh, of instability and, uh, and the lack of security. But then this is what the deal did, basically put a lid on any Iranian nuclear development and now without it there is a risk that Iran would actually resume that if the U.S. keeps pressing with sanctions and the European Union can't save the deal. Well, again, Iran is uh, obliged to maintain its uh, obligations towards the non-proliferation agreement, uh, irrespective of uh, the nuclear deal that was uh, forged between the United States and the other uh, uh, five uh, European uh, partners. Uh, and uh, we believe that that is a, a commitment that uh, that is... Uh, uh, honor bound, Iran is honor bound to, to maintain vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the uh, treaty.